first speaker is uh, Dr. Michael Benke from uh, LSU School of Veterinary Medicine. Um, he has obtained his PhD degree in molecular biology from Montana State University, and then he spent two years working as a postdoc in, at Washington University School of Medicine uh, in St. Louis, right? And uh, he joined LSU about a year ago as a faculty in the uh, Department of Pathological, uh, Pathobio, uh, Pathobiological Sciences uh, here at vet school. Uh, he is studying uh, regulatory mechanisms and uh, developmental cycles of parasites. And we had some interactions a few months ago when uh, we were working on a proposal together. And uh, this is when I learned a little bit about his research. Um, I find this very interesting, the way that he combines wet lab experiments um, and sequencing and some computational approaches in genomics and genetics. So that's why we were very happy when he accepted our invitation to give us a talk here uh, in the biological sciences. Uh, and with that, let's uh, welcome Dr. Benke and uh, listen to his talk on the world's most gregarious parasite. All right, well, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, so again, I'm uh, assistant professor, new assistant professor at uh, the School of Veterinary Medicine. Um, that's down Skip Berman Drive, if you haven't been down there near the levee. Um, and so I've been here about eight months and working on a parasite called Toxoplasma gondii. So that's what I'll be talking about today, some of the work that we've done over the past five years uh, using computational approaches. So the outline of the talk is uh, basically three sections. I'm going to cover the biology of toxoplasma to get you familiar with uh, what the parasite is, and its life cycles, etc. And then um, two sections on projects that have been done in the past five years that I've helped out on um, using computational approaches. One, the genomics of toxoplasma where We've sequenced 64 strains of the parasite and done some population biology and also looked for genes under positive selection or um, expanded genes uh, in terms of copy number variation. And then the last section will cover um, a forward genetics approach using genetic mapping um, or Q QTL analysis, uh, quantitative trait loci mapping. Um, where we look um, for genetic factors that are responsible for virulence differences in the parasite. So some strains of the parasite are virulent and some are um, less virulent or avirulent in mice. So those would be the three um, sections of the talk. So a little bit about the biology of toxoplasma. It's an apicomplexin parasite. This is a phylum that contains many different parasites, uh, single cell pro protozoan parasites. Um, that includes cryptosporidium, uh, which infects cryptosporidium parvum, which infects cows and humans. Um, Emeria, um, which there are many different species that infect uh, any, anywhere from certain species infect chickens and, and other poultry. Um, you've got infections in sheep and goats and, and cattle, so very many species of Emeria. You've got um, plasmodium which uh, is a cause of malaria, and then toxoplasma. So here we have a generic uh, life cycle for apicomplexin parasites, where we have these um, proliferative stages coming from the sporozoite, which the parasite can rapidly grow and expand in, in number. Um, but then if, it, if the parasite gets within its definitive host, and that's the host that it has to go through to go through the sexual stages of the life cycle, and all these parasites have a definitive host. Um, these forms can then differentiate into the sexual stages, uh, the male and female um, forms, and they'll eventually fuse, fertilize, go through meiosis, and produce an oocyst form. So for example, cryptosporidium has to go through, cryptosporidium parvum has to go through either a cow or a human to complete its life cycle, go through those sexual stages. And so some, you know, occasionally you'll hear about cryptosporidium outbreaks uh, in, in America. Amiria does the same, like Amiria tenella, has to go through the gut of a chicken to complete its life cycle. Plasmodium has to go through 
the mid-gut of a mosquito to complete its life cycle and go through those sexual stages. And then toxoplasma has to go through the gut of a cat, um, anywhere from your house cat to a mountain lion to a jaguar, any cat um, to complete its life cycle and go through these um, sexual stages. Another aspect is um, certain parasites um, are restricted to one host, so they only go through that definitive host, and that's like Cryptosporidium and Amiria. So they just go through, Cryptosporidium will just go through a cow, come out the back end, and then go back through a cow. Then other parasites have a two-host life cycle where they have that definitive host, but then there's an immediate um, imp, um, intermediate stages where the parasite infects intermediate hosts. So, for example, like Toxoplasma has to go through the gut of a cat, it's shed as noocyst, and then can be taken up by rodents or other mammals and go through these intermediate stages and, and, and grow there. And then if that um, intermediate host is taken up by a cat in a predator-prey situation, then the parasite can complete its life cycle. Apicomplexins share um, certain structures, um, organelles. Um, Mainly this apical complex, which is important for invasion, hence the name apicomplexin. And many of these parasites contain organelles important for that invasion. So we've got rope trees, which are these bulb-type organelles coming off the apical complex. There are micronemes, which are um, small vesicles which are secreted upon invasion and are important for that process. Um, and then dense granules, which aren't shown here, um, but those are constitutively secreted by these parasites. And so here you can see an electron micrograph uh, picture of a parasite attached to a host cell um, trying to invade. So uh, schematic of that is once a parasite attaches to a host cell, it will reorient itself to this apical end, secrete the contents of these organelles, the micronemes and the rope trees which are important for invasion, and um, moving junctions formed. And this is a ring which the parasite can then pull itself into the host cell, uh, pulls itself through this moving junction to form a parasitophorous vacuole, where the parasite is sequestered away from the contents of the host cytosol. So it's protecting itself from the host. And it's got a little nice niche here where it can, can live. A lot of these proteins, these rope trees, will be secreted and then traffic back to the parasitophorous vacuole. And they help to maintain the integrity of that vacuole and, and involved in other processes. Other rope trees traffic to the host nucleus or are involved in the cytosol to modulate the host cell response uh, to make it favorable, favorable for the parasite to live in that host cell. So here's a cartoon of um, basic apicomplexin. This is Toxo with, again, the rope trees, which I'll be talking about later. Um, and there's many different proteins which are secreted from these organelles upon invasion, micronemes and dense granules. These are all parasite-specific organelles. Here's an IFA of uh, Toxoplasma with both rope 1 and rope 18 antibody staining. And so you can see here both of those proteins have trafficked back to the parasitophorous vacuole ringing that parasite. Apicomplexins, a lot of, most apicomplexins are unique in that they have three genomes. So like all eukaryotes, they've got a nuclear genome where most of the genes reside. Toxoplasma has 14 chromosomes in that nuclear genome. Also has a mitochondria um, pared, pared down, very small genome. And then it's got this apicoplast. So this is um, a plant origin um, organelle, much like the mitochondria, it was acquired through an endosymbiotic event. Um, it's been shown to be evolved in fatty acid biosynthesis and a few other processes. But because of that plant origin, it's an active target for drug discovery to, to try to develop drugs that will target the apicoplast because you likely have a less chance of an off-target effect in mammals if you're targeting plant genes. So this is a pared down genome. It's like the mitochondria. Um, it's thought that most of the genes in the original um, organism that was engulfed, uh, those genes moved to the nucleus. Um, so here's likely what happened. And another aspect of the zapicoplast is it's got four membranes. So based off of that, uh, it's thought that 
the apical plasts is acquired by two endosymbiotic events. So like the mitochondria, we've got a prokaryote being engulfed by another cell to create a eukaryotic red algal cell. And then that red algal cell was engulfed by the ancestral apicomplexin to uh, then be an apicoplast within the apicomplexa. And then a lot of those genes from that ancestral algal cell moved to the nucleus. And so now they're produced, uh, these proteins are produced there, and they traffic back to the apicoplast to perform their function. It's kind of an interesting aspect of the parasite. So like cheeseburger, you can have toxoplasmosis. And because it has to go through the cat, uh, a lot of cats experience this. And we'll talk about that here in a second. And so do a lot of mammals. So we talked about intermediate hosts. The cat is the definitive host. But you've got all these intermediate hosts that toxo can invade. Essentially, it can invade every mammalian nucleated cell. It's thought because um, Zero prevalence studies in, in animal populations all, all over the world have been done. And essentially, some portion of those populations have been exposed to the parasite. They have antibodies to the parasite. So from rodents to farm animals to whales, they've all been shown to have antibodies to toxoplasma. So this is a unique aspect of toxoplasma in that it's got this wide intermediate host range, where most of these apicomplexins have a very strict Definitive host, which Toxo does, it's just cats, but then also a very res uh, restrictive um, intermediate host. So, um, but Toxo runs the gamut in terms of mammals and then also infects birds. So that's it's very widespread parasite worldwide. Um, some of the initial sampling that was done in the 70s and 80s was conducted in Europe and North America. And genotyping studies at that time found, and this is still holds, that the strains coming from these regions um, were very similar, and they collapse into basically three genotypes, which are termed types one, two, and three, because they were first to be described, of course. And so they're very genetically, they share a lot of, um, uh, they're very genetically similar and clonal in this respect, that they predominate in these regions. So this seemed unusual, that you've got these clonal expansion of these three genotypes throughout Europe, North Africa, and America. Since then, in the 90s and in the knots and later, more sampling has been done around the world, and we see much greater genetic diversity in South America. So based off of that, it's likely that Toxo evolved in South America and radiated from there, and then somehow clonally propagated through Europe and North America at some time. We don't know when. Um, it's possible with the domestication of the cat, which is the earliest known association of a cat with the human is um, about 10,000 years old, this burial in Cyprus where they found the remnants of a cat. Um, so it's possible that domestication of cats led to this expansion of certain genotypes that were could go through domesticated cats. Also, people have sequenced um, DNA from mummies in, in Egypt and they found um, toxoplasma reads from those. Now, whether that's contamination or not, it's unknown, but it suggests that toxoplasma was there at least seven, several thousand years ago, as opposed to toxoplasma being exported during the Columbian Exchange 500 years ago. So that's all um, possible um, dissemination of toxo. So because it can infect pretty much every mammal, it can infect you and me as well. And the prevalence rates around the world um, are, are different. So in North America, here in the United States, about 10 to 20 percent of the population has been exposed to the parasite. So the people have antibodies to them. And the older you get, the more likely you are to be seroconvert. Now regions, other areas in the world, like Brazil, have very high rates. Certain studies show 80 to 90 percent of groups within Brazil have been exposed to the parasite. And in Europe, uh, we've got high rates in France and Germany. So based off of these um, countrywide studies, it's thought that up to a third of the human population has been exposed to this parasite. So that's two billion people. That's a lot of, a lot of people. Now luckily, when you become infected, uh, humans 
um, mount the proper immune response. You might not even know you got infected or you might think you had the flu because there's a little interferon gamma response. Um, you get a headache. But um, that's going to control the expansion of the parasite. But the parasite can differentiate into a dormant phase called the bradyzoite. And so that's the that leads to chronic infection. Um, and so that bradyzoite, if your immune system crashes, can recrudesce or go back into this rapidly growing form called the tachyzoite that uh, is infectious and causes disease. So this was seen at the height of the HIV uh, AIDS epidemic here in North America, where you see a spike in HIV-associated hospitalizations due to toxoplasmosis, which thankfully has um, declined significantly and plateaued over time due to proper monitoring of um, zero conversion of patients, and then also um, there, there are good toxo drugs and um, heart therapies for um, antiretroviral therapies. And then you can see non-HIV associated hospitalizations have kind of remained static over time, where the mean age is a little higher. As you get older, your immune system weakens. So if you're chronically infected with a parasite, your immune system is compromised in some sort of way, whether it's organ donation, you're on chemotherapy for cancer or uh, viral infection, you can get a secondary complication of toxoplasma because it can start growing again. Other ways it causes disease is congenital toxoplasma. So you've probably heard that pregnant women shouldn't handle cat feces. It's because it could harbor the oocyst of the parasite. And if the woman has not been exposed to the parasite, doesn't have antibodies to it, uh, the parasite can expand somewhat and cross the placenta, infect the fetus, and create um, encephalitic, hydrocephalic diseases um, like this. And, you know, a couple hundred cases in the United States every year uh, with this. Also, for chronically infected individuals, um, you can get ocular toxoplasmosis, where another immune-privileged area. So the parasite likes to go into this chronic form in the brain of humans and mice. So you get this encephalitic type disease. Um, but it also, another immune privileged area is the human retina. And so um, ophthalmologists look for lesions in people's eyes. And if they see them, it's possibly due to toxoplasma, where the tachyzoite form is now growing for some reason and uh, creating these lesions in the retina, causing problems with vision and possible blindness. Now, you, anyone know this guy? Everyone knows this guy. He's the most hated man in America right now. Um, <clears throat> so Martin Screlly, he bought the main drug used to treat toxoplasma um, about six months ago and jacked the price up by 5,000%. So he's a poster child for high drug prices in America. And in fact, he was called before Congress last week and attempted to, um, they tried to get him to testify, but he pled the fifth the whole time. So. It was a big show, um, but he did buy the company that was making this drug. Um, the, the drug's called Daraprim. It's basically pyrimethamine. It's been used since the 1950s. Now, the thing you don't hear about in the story is that this drug is, is generic. It's, there's no patent on it, so anyone can make it if they wanted to. Um, and in fact, uh, Express Scripts and, and Primus have agreed to do that by offering Daraprim at a dollar a pill that this was the price the drug was at about five years ago. So this whole story has just kind of been used politically um, as an example for high drug prices, whereas in effect, we're still going to get cheap toxoplasma drugs because it's a generic drug and it's been used for 60, 70 years. <clears throat> you may have heard about behavioral changes. In the past five years, there have been a lot of stories in the media about how infected individuals, um, it, infection may alter behavior. And a lot of these studies have been done in mice where people have shown mice infected with the parasite seem to be less fearful of cat scent, so cat urine or cat uh, fur. And so the idea is these mice are um, less fearful and they're more easily preyed upon because they're infected. And so then the parasite can get back through the cat and complete its life cycle. Somehow the parasites figured out how to modulate the behavior of the mouse. 
This depends on the mouse background and the parasite strain you use. Some people see it, some people don't. Other groups have looked at associations between human behavior and, and seroprevalence, so whether you've um, been exposed to the parasite or not, and seen associations with greater traffic accidents with people who've been exposed to the parasite. People exposed to the parasite may be a little less altruistic, more greedy. And then um, one that's been known for decades is this association between schizophrenia events and um, toxoplasma titers. So whether the, the parasite's actively doing this or it's um, an effect of the immune response to the infection is not quite known yet, probably an active area of research. One caveat on this is with schizophrenia, toxoplasma is not the only association uh, in terms of infection. So there are viral infections, bacterial infections that are associated with schizophrenia. Um, so I like this quote by Robert Sapolsky. Some of you may know him. He's a popular biologist from Stanford who's looked at stress in animals and how hormones affect animals and then us. Um, he's written some popular books on that. But he's actually worked in this area looking at behavioral changes in mice with toxo infection. And, and so he knows the literature and basically saying, you know, these associations are interesting, but the effect sizes are pretty small. And so if we want to limit the number of traffic accidents, let's um, stop texting while driving or uh, drinking and driving. A little bit about the life cycle in, in uh, more detail. So I talked about that chronic form, the bradyzoite. Um, if uh, an infected mouse is chronically infected with these bradyzoite cysts and gets ingested by a cat, those bradyzoites can then invade the epithelial lining of the cat gut, those cells within the small intestine. And they'll differentiate into merozoites, which are a rapidly growing form of the parasite, get high parasite numbers, and they can reinvade other cells and eventually differentiate into the male and female forms, the micro and macrogamete, which then confuse to form the oocyst go through meiosis, get genetic recombination, shuffling of the genetic deck if you get two strains that are co-infecting a cat. Then those oocysts are shed into the environment and they differentiate into sporocysts, which are, or sporozoites within the sporocysts, which can infect intermediate hosts and the cat. Now this oocyst is the environmentally resistant form of the parasite, so it can reside in the soil for months to years it's resistant to desiccation, temperature changes, UV light. Uh, it can just sit out there and then infect food animals, humans, and um, for the classic part of the life cycle, rodents. And so then the sporozoites can differentiate into the tachozoite, which is a rapidly growing form in intermediate hosts, the cause of disease in humans, encephalitic type diseases. The parasite grows and ruptures cells. It creates plaques with either in the eye or the brain. But then if you mount a proper immune response, you can control that, and uh, the parasite will differentiate into the bradyzoite back to the chronic form. So that kind of completes the life cycle as described. So it's a two-host life cycle. You have that definitive host and then the intermediate host. Some pictures of toxo. We've got merozoites within the gut of a cat here. That first cell lining, epithelial lining, these kind of banana-shaped parasites, which rapidly grow and then eventually differentiate into these microgametes with flagella, much like a sperm, the male form, and uh, the macrogametes, kind of the egg. They can fuse to form these, then differentiate into these oocysts, which are um, autofluoresce under UV light, so it's kind of cool. You get a black lamp the next party and put out some oocysts, it might be kind of cool. Um, and so here's a picture of a cat villus with, um, infected with toxoplasma in red or red and, and yellow. So you can see that the infection could be quite high within the cat because these merozoites are expanding. Um, but the cat doesn't really die, it doesn't die from this. It might get a little sick, a little diarrhea. The infection will last a couple weeks. It'll shed oocysts within a week or so and then it will be uh, resistant to reinfection essentially for the rest of its life. It's got antibodies to the parasite. So cats get a little sick but th they can shed billions of oocysts over the course of the infection into the environment, so into your garden or whatever. All right, so then the tachozoite, once those oocysts get ingested by an intermediate host, 
they can differentiate into these tachozoites. So they look a lot like merozoites, these banana-shaped, crescent-shaped parasites. They can rapidly divide every six hours and expand if you don't have a proper immune system, cause disease. But if you do, differentiate into these bradyzoite cysts that contain um, hundreds of parasites, but they're not really dividing. They're just there um, for long periods of time, um, essentially for the life of the individual. And so they can occasionally recrudesce, maybe form a new cyst, but if the immune system is there checking it, it will really um, limit the expansion of the parasite. So how do you get toxoplasma? You can either get it with that oocyst from the environment in the soil, or more, more likely, um, probably, is eating uncooked meat. So a major route is probably through pork. Um, it's known that pork meat is kind of notorious for harboring large amounts of cysts if, if the pig had been infected with toxoplasma. For some reason, toxo likes to differentiate into these dormant stages in the muscle of pigs. It does not do this in cows. So the muscle of cow or beef does not really um, harbor bradyzoite cysts. So that's why there's a, you know, there was a push to cook your pork meat. Um, and it's likely, you know, people in France like their rare meat, um, as, as I do. And uh, in Germany, they like their pork sausage. And so it's thought that those are likely maybe the major routes for infections in humans and why they have a high prevalence right there. So that's kind of the wrap up of toxoplasma biology that I'll talk about. Um, so get into the two projects that kind of use computational approaches to understand more about uh, the parasite. The first one is this genomics approach where we sequence 62 strains of the parasite. And I'll be talking about the population structure and then also what makes toxoplasma unique, uh, mainly looking at parasite-specific genes and genes under um, selection that have expanded in terms of their copy number, so copy number variation. So this is the latest uh, kind of representation of the strains that have been isolated around the world. And the, kind of the take-home message here is, like I mentioned before, in Europe and North America, in these pie charts, you can see kind of just a few strain types. You get green and blue. Uh, these are type 2 and 3 parasites that predominate in these areas. And so very limited genetic diversity, uh, just three or four uh, strain types, type 1, 2, and 3, red, blue, and green. But in South America, you see this, you know, a rainbow of colors here, all these different strains representing uh, greater genetic diversity in various areas around South America. So um, representative strains, this, this is over a thousand strains here represented in all these pie charts. Representative strains from all those were chosen to do a, an unrooted uh, network map, phylogenetic network map. This represents about 80 strains and kind of shows the global population structure of Toxo using uh, around 11 markers. So we see about um, like the type 1, 2, and 3 parasites, they represent haplogroups. There are about 16 total haplogroups uh, that we know of uh, representing the global genetic diversity. And these collapse into about six different clades. So we wanted to look at that using uh, genomic sequences. Uh, could we understand more about the population biology when we have all the sequence, whereas here we're just using 11 markers? The second aspect of toxoplasma um, genetics or, or population biology was types 1, 2, and 3 shared an interesting aspect in their chromosomes. There's one chromosome called chromosome 1A. It's the smallest chromosome. All three parasite types had the same chromosome. So very few um, SNPs on the, those chromosomes compared between types 1, 2, and 3. And this is represented here. So in this graph, the SNPs on chromosome 1A between types 1 and 2 are in blue. And so very few across that chromosome. And then the SNPs on the next chromosome, chromosome 1B, between types 1 and 2 are shown in red. And you can see just gobs more SNPs. So for some reason, this chromosome, the same chromosome has been inherited by all three of these um, parasite strain types, whereas the other chromosomes are more diverse. So this is kind of a unique signature that had been noticed, and we wanted to see if 
these these termed monomorphic regions that you know um, they're shared between strains exist in other parts of the um, genome in other strains. So we sequence those 62 strains, kind of um, taken from this representation here, the, this pool of parasites, um, four essentially from each haplogroup were chosen, and then their full genomes were sequenced. So one of the first things we did was look at comparative genomics, um, comparing toxo to uh, close um, parasites. Um, we've got Hamandia, um, which like toxoplasma has to go through the gut of a cat, can infect rodents, go into this dormant phase, but does not infect all these other mammals. So it's very similar to toxo and very similar in genetically and also in its life cycle. But there's this unique aspect where toxo can, has expanded into all these other intermediate hosts and Hamandi is kind of restricted to uh, rodents. And so you can see this here in these uh, syntenic maps where we've got the 14 chromosomes of toxo and a line that spans to another genome is a representation that they share the same genes at the same location on those chromosomes. So they're syntenic. And you can see there's basically just a broad swath across for all the chromosomes to Omandia. So very similar genetically. And then you do the same to Neospora, Caninum. So Neospora is like Toxo, except it goes through the gut of a dog to, to complete its life cycle. And then infects bovids and the canids prey on the bovids and, and then get back through the gut of a, of a, a canid. And it too shares uh, great synteny, a little less than Homandia, but very, very similar to Toxo. So you've got three different parasites, very similar genetically, but some pretty interesting differences in terms of their biology. And then when you compare Toxo to um, Sarcocystis, um, that synteny breaks down, fewer lines. And then when you compare it to Amiria tenella, which goes through a chicken, um, there is no synteny. So you can see that here with how they relate phylogenetically using one gene and then syntenically in this circus map. So another thing we wanted to look at with using all these genomes were genes under positive selection. So there's kind of two ways you can do that. You can look for genes that have high SNP rates, DNDS ratios, and that suggests that they're changing rapidly and there's some sort of selective pressure to change for that gene. Or you can look for genes that have expanded in terms of their copy numbers. So they've been duplicated or, or more. And that allows the gene to broaden its sequence space and find new functions for uh, those genes. So looking at copy number variation, the way we did this is um, kind of illustrated here. This is kind of an example graph for chromosome 9 in GT1. Most of the chromosomes 1x. So toxoplasma is haploid. It's just got one set of chromosomes makes it kind of easy, easier to do this analysis. So we find what the 1x um, mean is for the genome, and basically the standard deviation for that range. And then what we were calling anything that had copy number variation, basically 2x or higher, was any region or gene that was three standard deviations above the 1x mean. Okay, So that's the standard deviations are in orange here. So anything above that's been called um, copy number variation. So you can see these large regions on the left end of chromosome 9 and GT1 that are duplicated, basically. And so we did this for all 62 um, strains and found certain strains with certain chromosomes that were basically had duplication events, large-scale duplication events. So either aneuploidy, where a chromosome's been completely duplicated, such as in Ray here, it has two chromosome 1As, or this strain has two chromosome uh, 3s, or large segmental duplication, so only a part of the chromosome, uh, but a large region has been duplicated. And you can see this in these other strains here. And we're here we have GT1, where we're on the left side of chromosome 9, um, like this graph, basically these three regions are here in red. Um, so it suggests this may be a way for the parasite to go through this, this uh, expansion of genes. But um, probably more importantly, biologically, are genes that um, have expanded just by themselves, not large regions of the genome, but have expanded and retained just in smaller regions, basically at the gene level. 
And so we looked at this also. We called all, all regions in terms of copy number variation. So here's an example, another plot of chromosome 12 in ME49 strain, where you have the 1x mean for the chromosome in terms of um, the, 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 the read depth. Um, one thing I didn't mention was the read depth when we do the alignments. I'll get to that in a second. But So we have the 1x mean, and certain areas are higher. And so for instance, this region here contains this gene, rope 5, and it's about 11-fold higher than the 1x mean. So we're seeing that rope 5 in this uh, strain, um, there's about 11 copies of this gene there. So this is a way to find genes that may be under positive selection, like the uh, DNDS ratio. They've expanded in terms of copy number. And what we found was um, that many of these genes that have expanded are parasite-specific genes. So these parasite-specific genes that I've mentioned before, rope trees, micronemes, GRAS, only represent about 5% of the genes in the genome. But yet, about half the genes that have been expanded are these genes. So there's a great enrichment for these genes in terms of how they've expanded in terms of copy number. We also identified new gene family here in purple, um, these TG fams, which we know nothing about, but they're newly identified, and they're parasite specific and also enriched in genes that have expanded. So this is just a representation of the ME49 genome. Uh, you've got all the genes out here. This is a circos plot. So if you're going to, you may have seen these type of plots before, but you're going to publish a genome paper, you know, it's probably good to have one of these in it. So here on the, on the outer ring are all the genes in the genome in terms of what strand they're on. And then these inner rings are basically those gene families laid out here with the genes um, in dots, uh, their locations plotted. And so the, the bigger the circle, the more um, gene copies they have. And so kind of illustrates the expansion of genes for these gene families. Then uh, to look at the population structure of the parasite in greater detail. I showed this graph before where we've got this unrooted network analysis of all the strains, uh, representative strains, using only 11 markers. Well, now that we've got all the sequence for 62 strains, uh, we essentially were able to call over 800, um, 802,000 SNPs. So that's essentially 802,000 markers. And when we use either 11 markers or 800,000, we essentially get the same network analysis. So this is kind of interesting if you're into phylogenetic analysis. Um, if you plan your markers correctly on different chromosomes, it's probably a pretty good representation using 10 or 15. So all these strains collapse into known clades, clades A, B, C, D, and E, very much like they did with the 11 RFLP markers. So this wasn't much of a surprise, but what was useful by sequencing the genome was looking for these monomorphic regions in, in the genome. So I, I mentioned that chromosome 1A where it was very similar between types 1, 2, and 3. So we wanted to see if there were similar regions um, between parasite strains for all the ones that we sequenced. So this essentially was doing pairwise comparisons for all 62 strains against all the others. And so that's 1,953 pairwise comparisons. So this is where you know, some computational approaches come in handy. You can write some scripts, do some iterations, and do all these pairwise comparisons um, between strains. And so we've got four examples here where if we compare ME49 to itself, you know, it's going to be the same. There's no SNP, SNP differences. It's just all monomorphic, of course, because it's compared to itself. But if we compare ME49 to a very similar parasite, another type 2, we see certain regions that kind of have this monomorphic signature, very low SNP rates, and then certain regions with higher SNP rates. So this is about 60% similar to ME49. When we look at CAS and ME49, we see that monomorphic chromosome 1A right here. But the rest of the genome, there's uh, they're, they're different, it's much greater diversity. And then when we look at ME49 and Coug, 
um, really there, there's no monomorphic regions. So we were able to use all these um, 1900 pairwise comparisons and um, cluster that data using a heat map program in R. And what was interesting was is that the strains independently collapsed into clades using a different metric as they did with um, using all the SNPs in this program here, the network analysis. So we get the grouping of parasites into clade A here, and they all group together using this other metric um, into clade A. So this suggests that these monomorphic regions are, are explain a lot of the population structure of Toxo. And what, what's going on here is there's admixture going on. These parasite strains are being co-infected into a cat and going through recombination and sharing genetic material. Um, and so many of the strains within a clade share these uh, haploblocks or um, regions of similar genetic diversity. So in this graph where you have white and yellow, there's higher similarity and where you have red, there's lower similarity. And so that's, um, you can see how they've grouped together in terms of clade here. So being, you know, sequencing all the genomes allowed us to, to see this. And then because of this, um, we see all these strains collapsing into a clade. We wondered if they all shared the same monomorphic region. So these are just pairwise comparisons between two. But if we look at, for instance, all 18 strains within clade A, do they share all one monomorphic region? So if we average those 18 together, we do see certain regions that are basically monomorphic, um, that they all share. And this may be a mechanism for selection that whatever environment these parasites have come from, they, they may need these um, pieces of the genome to survive in those environments better. And so we've just represented that here and with red lines showing for each clade which regions in the genome do all the strains within that clade share in terms of uh, low genetic diversity or monomorphic regions. We found that these regions are enriched in these parasite-specific genes, much like the, their, the um, copy number variations enriched. And so we just highlight what possible genes may be driving the retention of these conserved monomorphic regions. So that's kind of the end of the genomics uh, project. How did we go about doing this in terms of computational approaches? What, did, what programs did we use? Um, for those 62 genomes, we had to align them to a reference genome. So we used ME49 as a reference genome. So we've got to align all those. Um, and so we use Bowtie for that. Um, and then that allows you to do two things that I explained here. Use information. You can call SNPs. So you can see what um, polymorphisms there are between those two strains. And then get all the SNPs between the 62 strains. And then you can also use the read depth of that alignment to look at copy number variation. So those are some of the plots that I showed. So it's read depth and SNPs. And you can call SNPs using SAM tools and this program here, which is part of the suite, uh, Bowtie and Top Hat and all these great programs. Or determine re uh, read depth using uh, mpileup. And then you get all this data, so you're going to have to do a little script writing in Linux, most likely, and R scripts to um, analyze that data. Um, that was also useful in doing this pairwise um, comparison with um, 1900 pairwise comparisons to look at that admixture in monomorphic regions. And then you can have these huge data files that you know you can, might be able to import into Excel with tables and all that, but it, it's nice to be able to visualize that. So here are some examples of some programs that are helpful in visualizing data. So the Circos has been a very popular program the last five years or so. Um, and so I recommend going to this site, www.circos.ca. Um, this program's there's a million ways you can represent your data with this program. There's uh, config files. There's just so many different options that you can do. So at this website, and I'll have a lot of good examples of how people have used this program to represent their, their data. And it just, it doesn't have to be genomics data. It can be any data that is going to be compared. Then the phylogenetic network was used with split trees, a popular program for running unrooted phylogenetic network analysis. 
And then um, R, of course, is very useful in analyzing the data and then also visualizing it with plot or, or heat map. And so the last section, uh, let's see how much time I have here. Try to get through this real quick. Um, is a project where we were able to use the, the genetic information that we had in genomes and apply that to understand more about phenotypic differences in the strain. So I mentioned before that certain strains are more virulent in mice than others. And so we used a forward genetics approach of genetic mapping, QTL um, mapping to understand more about what's driving virulence in these parasites and kind of let us understand more about the biology in general. So despite this limited genetic diversity in types 1, 2, and 3 parasites, there's a huge phenotypic difference where type 1 parasites are virulent. You can inject one parasite into a mouse and that mouse will die within two weeks because um, it's going to grow and expand and cause disease. So very resistant to the mouse immunity. Then there's type 2, it's moderate, so it depends on the mouse strain and the parasite load, but you can, certain strains, uh, they're, they, they're, the mice are not going to die and, and others they will. And then essentially avirulent strains, type 3, where you can inject thousands of parasites into a mouse and the mice won't even hiccup. So we use this phenotypic difference uh, to, to look at um, what factors may be driving this. Um, and so the approach we took was this genetic mapping of forward genetics. And so one aspect of the toxobiology that allows this to happen is that we can do recombinant crosses in cats. If we co-feed a cat two different strains of the parasite, so in this case we have type 1, which is virulent, and type 3, which is avirulent, feed both of those to a cat, they'll go through that sexual recombination, shuffle the genetic deck, and on the back end, you'll get progeny, hopefully, that are a combination of both parents. So they have some parts uh, they've inherited from the type 1 and some that they've inherited from type 3. So you do um, you know, genetic markers, or now we just sequence the progeny and get all the SNPs. So depending on how many markers you have, you can create a genetic map across all the chromosomes for those progeny. And you choose those progeny which have a unique genetic signature. So they, they have a unique genetic pattern that they inherited from these two parents. And then, so that's one thing you need. You need the genetic map from the progeny. So in this case, we had 34 informative progeny. And then the other thing you need is the phenotype. So you assess these progeny, the phenotype that you know is different in the parents. So in this case, it's virulence in mice. And so we looked at that, and certain progeny are virulent, certain progeny are avirulent. And so when you do a QTL map um, scan, basically what you're testing is an association between the genotype at a particular marker and that pattern against the phenotype. And so the higher the association, the greater the significance or LOD score. And what you can do is basically um, plot those significant scores across all the chromosomes uh, in order, you know, the markers across all the chromosomes. And you'll get peaks and valleys and then, you know, great peaks here. So, the, you know, the computational approach comes in here is you've got sometimes thousands of markers and you need to test those associations with your data. And then also you need to do many permutations of that data randomly to know what just kind of the background noise is going to be. So any peak above that uh, threshold is going to, uh, particular threshold is 0 0.05 here or 0 0.005, is going to be significant. And so those are interesting. And in this case, we got one peak on chromosome 7A and uh, for the 1 by 3 cross. And so this peak was eventually narrowed to about 21 genes. And eventually, the gene expression differences between the parental strains was looked at. And it was noticed that one gene uh, has major gene expression difference where it's not expressed in type 3 parasites, and it is in type 1 parasites. And so this kind of screamed out as a candidate gene for the locus. Um, because you can identify a locus with QTL scanning, but it's going to contain a number of genes, depending on uh, 
the detail of your genetic map. And so in this case, it was 20 genes. So we had to figure out which of these 20 was the virulence factor. It looked like ROPE18. So what um, Sonia did was she expressed ROPE18 in the type 3 parasite, and then that parasite became virulent. So you can just express this one gene and confer virulence on that avirulent parasite. ROPE18 is secreted by the parasite as it invades out of those rope trees that I talked about. It's a kinase, so it phosphorylates things. And so it was shown that you know you have to express this ROPE18 and it has to be an active kinase to be uh, confer virulence. So you need the active kinase. So another cross that we did um, to look at virulence factors was a one by two cross. And so we knew both of these strains expressed ROPE18. So it's likely ROPE18 wasn't going to be the causal gene in the differences between these two parasites. So again, type 1 is virulent, and then in this experiment, type 2 is essentially avirulent. So we did the same thing, co-fed them to cats, selected informative progeny on the back end, um, found 45 of those, then assessed the phenotype in mice. Certain progeny were virulent, certain weren't, and then ran a QTL scan for that phenotype. And again, you've got all the markers laid out across the chromosomes chromosome 1A to 14, and we don't see a peak at rope 18, but we do see one significant peak on the left side of chromosome 12, and this accounted for about 90% of the virulence phenotype. We were able to narrow this down to about 50 genes in this case, and we took the same approach as uh, the other cross where we looked at gene expression, but also looked at copy number variation, so this suggests that genes are under positive selection. And we found there were two genes that had expression differences, but only one that also had expression differences and copy number variation. And the annotation on this gene was also interesting. It's a rope tree. So it's going to be secreted by the parasite. It's, 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 a, it's got a kinase domain, much like rope 18, but it's not active. It's a pseudokinase. So this became our main um, virulence candidate. We were able to stitch together the different alleles of this, pairs, um, this protein, ROPE5, by using Sanger sequencing, so much longer reads, and we were able to kind of stitch together um, the alleles because the SNPs on those longer reads spanned um, the read. And so we were able to reconstruct the alleles for the different strains and then see what residues were conserved in the kinase domain. And, you know, it is a pseudokinase, so it's, it's not going to be phosphorylating things, but it, it does have that um, domain. And then knowing the, um, the structure of, of the alleles, they were tandemly duplicated. And so knowing this, we were able to design a strategy to remove all those genes by replacing it with a drug-selectable marker, and that's just a confirmation PCR confirmation there. And so when we remove rope 5 from the parasite, unlike the wild type parasite, when again you, you inject one parasite into a mouse, it's going to kill the mouse, we can inject a million parasites of the delta rope 5, if it doesn't have rope 5, into the mouse and the mice don't even get sick. So rope 5 is required for that virulence. And then if we complement with a cosma that contain rope 5, it restores virulence. So now we've got these two genes. We've got ROPE5, it's a pseudokinase. It doesn't phosphorylate, but it's, much, it's got the kinase domain like ROPE18. And then we've got ROPE18, which is an active kinase. And what are they doing? So many experiments later, uh, this is fleshed out, where when a parasite invades uh, a mouse cell and, and the cell recognizes that, it, you'll get an interferon gamma response. And so that will then induce a certain number of genes to be expressed by that host cell. You get an, um, so it's interferon uh, regulated genes. And there's up to a thousand of those. Some of those are called IRGs, and so they're up they're they're produced upon interferon gamma stimulation after infection. And what these IRGs do is they traffic, they're expressed within the cytosol, and they traffic to non-host vacuoles. So that would include that that includes a parasite. So if rope 5 and rope 18 aren't there, the IRGs can go to the vacuole and bleb the vacuole, kind of destroy it until the parasite is exposed to the cytosol and it dies. If rope 5 and rope 18 are there, they both have to be there. What looks to be happening is rope 5 is recognizing the IRG, 
attaching to it, binding to it, and then allowing rope 18 and a rope 5, rope 18 complex to phosphorylate the IRG. So when the IRG is phosphorylated, it can no longer dimerize and then do its action on the parasite vacuole. So it does, doesn't traffic to the vacuole anymore. And this is highlighted here where we have a wild type parasite in red. It's got both rope 5, rope 18. And so upon interferon gamma stimulation, you do not see IRGs, which, are, which should be green here, ringing this parasite. But when you remove rope 18, you do see that. When you remove rope 5, you see these parasites ringed in IRGs. These parasites are going to die. And then if you restore, uh, or if you, if you restore rope 5 or rope 18, you basically get a wild type parasite where they're resistant to this. You only see the red, which is a parasite protein that's quantified here. So what it looks like is going on is you've got this battle going on at the parasite vacuole between the parasite and the mouse. We've got this rope 5 um, gene family, which has been expanded in very, you know, all the strains we've looked at. There's some sort of copy number variation, uh, some higher degrees than others. Uh, and so this is kind of represented here. We've got this expansion of rope 5s and these different strains of toxoplasma representing different alleles. And then, interestingly, the IRGs in mice have expanded. So in various strains of mice, we've got different patterns of IRGs expanded. Um, so it looks like you know, maybe these rope fives evolved to recognize these IRGs, which then expand and try to evade um, the rope five recognition to get to the parasite vacuole. So you've got this um, expansion of genes uh, going on in terms of mouse innate immunity and parasite growth. So in summary, we've used uh, genomics or uh, sequencing 64 strains of the parasite to look at the population structure, um, identifying genes under positive selection in terms of copy number variation, which has been shown to be important for the biology, and that there's a lot of this admixture going on in the environment that really explains a lot of the population structure. We had, um, and then the forward genetics approach of using QTL analysis um, to identify virulence factors, in this case, rope 18 and rope 5, which are critical for the parasite to grow within the mouse. So I'd like to, a lot of this work was done with uh, David Sibley at WashU, um, and then the Toxoplasma Genome Project, uh, led by uh, Hernan Lorenzi um, at Tiger, or JCVI. <laughs> Tiger's real name. So, you know, the toxoplasma community was involved in all that. And then LSU for um, bringing me here and, and allowing me to set up a, a lab at the School of Veterinary Medicine. So if anyone's interested in, in working on toxo, um, let me know if you're interested in a summer project or a graduate school or something like that. So are there any questions? Thanks. Thank you. All right, we have time for a couple of quick questions, maybe. Anyone? So can I ask one real quick? So one of the general things we always ask people who come to give these talks uh, is a little bit about your background. And obviously, computational tools were important to the genomic part of your work. Where did you develop those? Did you pick them up on the fly? Did you sort of learn formally? or? to um, where I'm at now. So I studied microbiology as an undergrad, but then um, that was in Arizona, so moved uh, and then didn't go to grad school right away. So I got a job at um, a couple computer companies, and that's where I learned uh, Unix. Uh, I knew a little bash as a kid and all that. Um, so I, I learned Unix and command line scripting um, at a couple companies I worked for. And then eventually got, you know, wanted to get back into science. So I got a job because I knew Unix and some command line um, programs and so forth. I got a job in a Toxo lab in Montana, uh, working as a, a lab personnel there. Um, 
doing annotations on some of the sequencing that was going on and various things, setting up their, their Unix platform, so kind of getting a bioinformatics project going in that lab. And so I really liked it, so I decided to go back to grad school. And so since then, just uh, continually learning um, various approaches to using uh, computation and, and biology. I'd say I'm more experienced on the wet side, um, but I've used both. I've used both. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Python or Perl. I use Perl. Python, I don't know which one's more popular now. So for scripting, that's a great way to go. The language is pretty easy to learn. Uh, there are some great books out there. And so if you're doing some, you know, nothing that's going to take days to run, uh, those are pretty good languages to use. Now if you're going to use more intensive uh, programming, then you might want to learn C but or other similar programs. I don't know those. Um, but I use Perl, and I know Python's kind of a, um, an extension of that. And then R, so uh, there's a lot of programming you can do in R um, to analyze your data. So I would say those two have been the ones I've used the most. Bash scripting, if you know how to um, bash script, that helps too. So. Yeah. Other questions? Thanks again.